Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock and genre fiction flavoured podcast. Our diversification into the wider bookshelves of Pops and my uncles continues, and, this time out, we're revisiting James Herbert. Herbert's novels in the 70s and early 80s maintained a brutal disaster theme, albeit one that manifested itself through a variety of methods that flew in the face of what Brian Aldis called the cosy catastrophe. Aldis, in his history of science fiction, Billionaire Spree, when talking about John Wyndham, said, The essence of cosy catastrophe is that the hero should have a pretty good time. A girl, free sweets at the Savoy, automobiles for the taking, while everyone else is dying off. Now, for all British farts of my vintage, that label grew beyond the original target of Aldis's take, largely thanks to some of the British TV I grew up with, and we may well take a look at some of that at some point further down the line, as well as the counterpoints that shared visions of the fucked-up Britain that weren't so comfortable. But Herbert was at the forefront of a contingent of British writers hell-bent on fucking up Britain. For this show, I'm joined once again by Graham, aka Decadnitz, and we'll play the show out with one of his macabre tunes, and also by friend of the show, Miles, co-host of the Casual Trek podcast. We talk about James Herbert's The Dark, the nature of the uncozy catastrophe, and a few other things. It is extremely gratifying to know that our venturing into these areas has struck a chord with some of our listeners, and over on YouTube, TetsuCat13 commented, I've waited with excited anticipation for months for your Halloween special and have not been disappointed. The highlight being Lady Parts and Teeth. I nearly choked laughing. Amazing. Then you talk about Life Force, which I've only just got on old DVD. I enjoyed it much more now than back then when it came out. Tonight, I just started watching Skinwalkers, and the first film advertised was The Mist, and then Teeth. Spooky or what? But true. Well, Tetsuka 13, that is spooky. Several stars have aligned for this show, and also apologies to Jules Lawrence, who, whilst listening to our episode on the fog, said that he almost crashed his car driving to work from laughing at the James Herbert vs. Lady Parts discussion. Sorry, Jules, but there might be a bit more of that here. But back to Tetsu Cat 13 for a moment, who said, Talking about the Cat Lady, one of the books from the past I still have is The Cats by Nick Sharman, published by New English Library. Price, 75p, and The Rats was only 60p. Well, thanks again for dropping us a line, TetsuCat13, and also for sending me to eBay for a copy of The Cats by Nick Sharman. I love the cover. So this one is for you. Sit back, turn the lights up high, and join us as we venture on your behalf into... The Dark. <laughs> We're back in Virtual Derry and Tom's, and this is a very special trip to Virtual Derry and Tom's, because not only have I got Graham here. Hello, Graham. Hey, how's it going? Very well. We've also got an all-new guest, an all-new arrival in Derry and Tom's in the form of Miles. Miles reed Lobato. Hello, Miles. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to the Virtual Derry and Tom's. The decor is exquisite and beer more so. Well, it's an absolute pleasure, and we'll get on to beer in a second, because we've all got ourselves a nice little slate of dark beers. Why dark? Well, we'll get on to that. Although, to be fair, we normally drink rotten dark beers on this podcast when I do delve into the beer, but hopefully we'll get some good ones. First order of business, Miles, what is your background with... I mean, normally we'd ask, what is your background with Mocock? We can ask that question, but of course, today we're actually talking about James Herbert again. So it's a twofold question. What is your background number one with Moorcock, and why on earth have you been reading James Herbert? Well, the how I got into Moorcock will probably get me a lifetime ban from the podcast, <laughs> because I actually got into Moorcock um, via Grant Morrison's Gideon Stargrave in The Invisibles. Oh, um, yeah. everybody has their entry. And it was through that which got me to track down, which told me about this Jerry Cornelius character. So the first Moorcock books that I picked up were The Life and Times of Jerry Cornelius, the Opium General, and the adventures of Catherine Cornelius and Una Person, which is not the best starting off <laughs> material. Yeah. And then someone told me about the uh, the the Elric and Hawkman, the Eternal Champion stuff. Like this is early Y2K, so I kind of thought that all fantasy was either Tolkien inspired or just these huge Robert Jordan Wheel of Time doorstoppers. Mm. And I picked up Elric and I started reading him like 
never looked back. You know, I, tr- I once tried a Wheel of Time book, and on on a friend's, well, a friend of a friend's advice, we were sitting one afternoon drinking at the Saltair Dragon Boat Festival, which I, I won't explain. And she tried to sell me on the Wheel of Time, and she also said that she wanted to do a podcast on the Wheel of Time. I thought, all oh, sounds very interesting. So I picked up the first copy of The Wheels of Time. I think over the next six months, I tried maybe three times and never got more than 40 pages in. And I even tried with the TV series and never got more than two episodes in. So I don't know. Robert Jordan, not for me. I, I read Wheel of Time, but I cheated by doing it in the three years before the last book came out. So I spe- I powered through it, unlike a lot of people who spent like 20 years reading and waiting for the damn thing to be done. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but it was... It, it's very slow and it it's lugubriously paced and just mm. there are books where nothing happens and there's 600 pages and somehow that should be illegal yes it absolutely should although you know if people are out there who dig it good luck to them what about oh, you yeah. graham are you a, are you a robert jordan no <laughs> <laughs> no I've, I've um i've seen his books in the um in various bookshops and i i just can't bear it. I think I worked with someone who was raving about them and mm. I I just couldn't yeah, I I stopped having that sort of conversation around fantasy with this guy because I realized what he was into was so drastically different to what I was into that there was no point having those sort of conversations. Mm. I even tried his one of his Conan novels and he, he manages to make Conan soporific. <laughs> but you don't read a Conan book to find out about his dad's blacksmith business, do you? Just no. Not for me. Anyway, my, back to Miles. Miles, Moorcock. But w- why are you reading James Herbert, I wonder? Um, Because of this podcast, to be honest. You did the episode on The Fog, and I thought, I'll track it, you know, I'll track it down. Will be a laugh. Checked out The Fog, and it was insane. <laughs> and then I then read Haunted, hmm. which was a very much, was a much different beast. The Fog was clearly written with one hand it, and just pure unabashed id and haunting haunted was like a much more slower paced novel about tone mm. and then you you invited me on to do the dark and so picked up a nice chunky four book volume of james herbert which you can't see thanks to my uh, background and yeah i read it well, you know what? We're absolutely delighted that you took the time to dive down the James Herbert rabbit hole based upon that episode of The Fog. And I should explain the reason why we decided to do The Dark was that after Graham, Phil and I did The Fog, I was thinking I was thinking about The Fog, and, and I can't remember how, but I came across that old definition of cosy catastrophe that Brian Aldiss came up with in his History of Science Fiction Billion Year Spree as a dig at John Wyndham. And what he said was, the essence of cozy catastrophe is that the hero should have a pretty good time, a girl, free sweets at the Savoy, automobiles for the taking, while everyone else is dying off. <laughs> and fair enough, I think when, when you do read some John Wyndham, that is an identifiable description. But I was thinking about it and I'm thinking, well, James Herbert was doing these massive catastrophic disaster novels with kind of a sci-fi edge. Not really sci-fi because everything is so grounded. And we did The Rats a couple of years ago. Then we took a year off Herbert and did Night of the Crabs. Awesome. Revisited Night of the Crabs, did Crabs Moon. Listeners, check them out. They're a a bundle of fun. But after doing The Fog, I was thinking, James Herbert really was at the forefront of a movement to really overturn that cosy catastrophe definition and do things that were in no way cosy, that were challenging, that were deeply unpleasant graphic okay they do tend to resolve themselves at the end so i was thinking about this i was thinking right what 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 should we do to follow up on this and have a conversation about james herbert and uncozy catastrophes and anybody else who was out there who was doing this kind of thing in the 1970s but before we get onto that just on that cozy catastrophe thing jane rogers said in the guardian she said I had attributed a rather different meaning to the term. I'd taken it to mean, quite simply, fiction set in a recognisably realistic world, familiar, therefore cosy, a world that is blown apart by a catastrophic event, 
When the judges of the Arthur C. Clarke Awards suggest that my novel, The Testament of Jesse Lamb, was a cosy catastrophe, I was very pleased, knowing the term had been coined to describe Wyndham's work, and being a great Wyndham fan, I hope their understanding of it was as vague as mine. In fact, Aldous' description is so specific and limiting that I can hardly think of a single novel it applies to other than Kraken, I have Kraken Awakes, and Day of the Triffids. So, she disagrees with Aldis, really. Was Aldis being a little bit um, overly critical? Because there's certainly some stuff that, that isn't particularly cosy. The Death of Grass, for example, is pretty grim in places. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the film of The Death of Grass. It's hilariously grim. I, I have not. The only Wyndham I've read is Day of the Triffids, which is always a joy, and the uh, old 60s BBC radio dramatisation. And, of course, The Midwich Cuckoo which which is village of the damned which ends with a lot of child death so that's not it's it's really cozy up until the end until they blow up a building full of evil psychic kids but <laughs> still you just blown up a whole bunch of kids for your final for your final denouement mm. what could be less cozy than that yeah and th there was uh another summary done by uh joe walton who wrote Tooth and Claw and some other things. And for Tor.com, this is the last one I'll read. It said, in the classic cosy catastrophe, the catastrophe doesn't take long and isn't lingered over. The people who survive are always middle class, have rarely lost anyone significant to them. The working classes are wiped out in a way that removes guilt. The survivors wander around an empty city, usually London, regretting the lost world of restaurants and symphony orchestras. There's an elegiac tone, so much that was so good has passed away. Nobody ever regrets football matches or carnivals. Then they begin to rebuild civilization along better, more scientific lines. Cozy catastrophes are very formulaic. Unlike the vast majority of science fiction, you could quite easily write a program for generating one. So there's there's a, a, a another angle on that, but that's a pretty good summary when I think back to, I don't know, British TV from the 70s, maybe the early 80s. So for old British farts like me, obviously, this label grows beyond the, t the original target of, of Aldous's take. I mean, The Day of the Triffids, obviously, was based on John Wyndham. Starts pretty grim, has that wonderful, very short scene where they pass a couple of children impaled on some farming equipment or something, which is really, really grim, but... It soon settles into a post-apocalyptic version of the good life by the end. <laughs> and and that, that happens quite a lot. Terry Nation's Survivors series starts fantastic. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. series, absolutely brilliant. End of the first series, the female actor who plays the most interesting character leaves. There were, I think there were problems in her personal life, whatever it was, I can't quite recall. She leaves, and over the following two series, it basically becomes post-apocalyptic Emmerdale Farm. It's really goes downhill terribly and then of course we've got john pertwee era doctor who where massive world threatening things doctor and joe tell off old stiff crusty ministers uh scoot about in funky motors but they've always got time for a brew at unit hq whether it's temporary or in the field and they always have a happy ending unless unless we're talking about maybe the silurians so middle class protagonists land rovers girl to look after, bit of gardening in a nice house in the country. That's admittedly my favourite era of classic Doctor Who, because it just it is so, that's my comfort food. Doctor Who, you know, hurt we in some crushed velvet, gonna beat up some security officers and just talk patronising to everyone else. <laughs> yeah. When you've had a rough day at work, yeah, just what you need. But also with like cozy catastrophes, I'm thinking of like the tripods of the 80s mm. where aliens take over the world and just put all the people in nice little villages in the Midlands mm. and anywhere else like Paris, you know, Paris, devastated. But anyway, as long as you live in that nice little West Country's villas, cushy. There was a lot of it about, wasn't there? But I, I think there were, to be fair to British TV, there were also some other slightly more grim examples but we'll probably get to them on a on a different podcast because today we're talking about herbert being really the antithesis to all of this and we talked about the fog on a previous podcast miles you read it it was completely bonkers it was bonkers when i read it in the early ages <laughs> um but i remember getting a, f a copy of the dark in the 80s and reading it for the first time and my memory of it before rereading it for this podcast was that it was like the fog on steroids. So if the fog was bonkers, the dark really, really ramped it up in my memory. Actually, that's why 
I decided that we should read it and talk about it and talk more broadly about Herbert's development and maybe about a few more examples of that uncozy catastrophe that he ushered in. Or he was amongst a group of authors who ushered that kind of thing in. But when I got my copy of it, and here's my, here's my copy, uh, that old classic cover with the... It's not really particularly indicative of the contents because it's some kind of strange, bald, naked weirdo staring out of the shadows. This is uh who who is this? This is a new English Library edition, which is nice. I think it's a okay. first edition. And I flipped it open. When when it arrived, I unwrapped it, I flipped it open, and I thought, oh, just have a quick look. And the very first paragraph I alighted on is the very worst paragraph <laughs> in the entire book. And content warning for anybody listening, there might be some choice language and some fairly unpleasant scenes referred to. But this is what jumped off the page at me. A young girl, probably in her early twenties, struggled with two men on the room's worn settee, which stood beneath the high bow window. They held her wrists and legs. Her skirt was pulled up around her waist, and a woman knelt before her, pushing something bulky between the girl's thighs. I won't read the rest of the paragraph, because it's deeply unpleasant, but it's a shotgun, and yes, they do go there. They <laughs> use the old Hitchcock thing of, if you're going to have a shotgun on the mantelpiece, use it. In this case, if you're going to have a shotgun, up a poor girl's chuff, use it. It's a genuinely harrowing and terrible paragraph. <laughs> that, that reminded me that, yes, this is yeah. the fog on steroids. It's, it's interesting that the first paragraph you uh, you encountered also mentioned thighs, yes. which is a, a, yes. <laughs> a common thing for, yeah. for Herbert. Yeah, and when it comes to some of the things that Herbert, some of his proclivities let's say, particularly when it comes to the female anatomy. On one score, there's not that many references to thighs. There's only one reference to triangle. However, there are a couple of cracking references to breasts, and we'll, we'll probably get to those in due time. But you both read The Dark, so I'm going to ask you both for a 60-second elevator pitch on what The Dark is about. So, Miles, you're the noob. Let's go with you. What is right. your 60-second The Dark elevator pitch? Okay. Right. Chris Bishop, psychic researcher, is brought back to the Beechwood house by Joseph Kulak, a blind parapsychologist, and Jessica, his rather attractive daughter. In the past there, Boris Prislak and Dominic Kirkwood, occultists, performed terrible practices there, and Chris had found the grisly aftermath. More grisly murders are happening in the streets around Beechwood, and Jacob believes that some part of Prislak's influence remains. After a set of shocking events, Beechwood House is torn down, allowing the dark forces inside to escape and spread further and further. This shadowy darkness turns people into crazed killers, including a nurse, a collection of schoolboys, Bishop's hospitalized wife, and an entire football stadium. As more and more of England succumbs to darkness and madness, our heroes must find out what is causing this evil and what must be sacrificed to halt it from engulfing, not just the city of London, but maybe even the British coast and beyond to the Midlands. <laughs> Excellent summary. Graham? Well, I don't think I can top that in any way. That's um, <laughs> pretty spectacular, Miles. Um, I think the only thing that I would say, there is some romance in there. It's an interesting romance. It's quite quite deep and a little bit uncomfortable. Not in a... <laughs> not in a uh, not in a particularly disturbing way, but more in a sort of a psychological, you know, weird relationship type thing. Um, and it, it goes on for a bit. Yes, it does. I've, we'll, we'll get to our thoughts on the book as a whole, but I do think it drags a little bit. And I think it's got a terrible pacing issue in the final third, which most James Herbert books don't have. They rattle to a close. This one, maybe not so much, but we'll talk about that as we get there. So yeah, in summary, our key characters are Bishop, who is a parapsychology investigator, but a skeptic. Mostly that theorizes ghosts and other apparitions result from a combination of latent telepathy and electrical fields. And some of the more interesting stuff in the book actually is is some of the long conversations that go on for pages and pages where they're philosophizing about the nature of human souls after death, evil, ghosts, all sorts of other stuff. He has a default female companion, Jessica. Pretty quickly, he mentally notes her figure, small breasts, and boyish physique before almost anything else, which is standard to James Herbert. Her father is Professor Jacob Kulek, who had this relationship with... 
Prislak and Kirkwood, who Miles mentioned. They have a medium compadre, Edith Matlock. We get Inspector Peck, the copper, who turns out to be a fairly decent copper. We also get some other absolutely fantastic copper characters who, sadly, we either don't get enough of or they die too early. More on them later. And the villains of the piece, so this Boris Prislak deceased cult leader, and he has this cult working in London to further his ends. But the cult has two main cheeses, tall woman and short, plump breast woman. And we never find out what the names are, but they do get up to no good. So that's essentially the dramatis personae, or personae, however the fuck you pronounce it. I don't know, I'm from all. But that's essentially <laughs> everybody that we've got, isn't it? Now, we can't cover this book in the detail that we normally do, because it goes on forever, but we can have a look at some talking points. But first, our next order of business is, as we're reading the dark, we've all selected a dark slate of beers. So, Miles, what have you got to go at this evening? The first I got is a local Wisconsin beer, which is Eastside Dark Dark Lager. Mm. It is a German lager yeast, which rounds out the brew of a smooth, complex finish. And it is brewed in Milwaukee. I lovely love the city. Dark lagers. And I've also got my second beer of choice is is the Capital Brew, which is brewed, ah, it's brewed right here in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the Munich Dark, and it is a another German-style Wisconsin beer. Sounds good. What you got, Graham? I've picked uh, an Abbeydale Brewery Black Mass, which is, a, which is a black IPA, and I will read the blurb in the back. Part of our heritage range since 1996, Black Mass is one of the world's longest-standing black IPAs. A well-bodied dark beer with a complex malt backbone, generously hopped with a blend of Green Bullet, Columbus and Cascade, delectable aromas of dark chocolate, coffee and burnt toast give way to flavours reminiscent of bitter chocolate, fruitcake and raisins. And it's a 6.66%, as you can imagine. Also sounds absolutely marvellous. Why burnt toast? It just doesn't seem like a fail if you go for a beer, like, mm, burnt toast. Yeah, I have to say, I can't taste the burnt toast in it, which I'm glad. Unfortunately, I don't have any black lager or black IPA, because I drank it all. Um, I had some rather nice, I think it was Loch Lomond Brewery, black IPA, which was very nice, from Lidl as well. It was quite reasonable. But for this evening, I've gone with a Kirkstall Brewery's Sticky Toffee Stout, a cosy, warming winter stout with flavours inspired by the most comforting of desserts, custard not included so this is probably going to be sweet and sickly that's at five percent i've made probably a schoolboy error in that i had two wild child christmas porters on christmas eve and they weren't really to my tastes but this one is called dope fiend d-o-u-g-h-p and it's a cookie dough ice cream porter at 5.5 percent we've got another porter for you all all you dark beer lovers this one is dope as hell, an array of darker and biscuit malts combined with a healthy dose of lactose for the ice cream vibe and a natural cookie dough flavouring will have you feeling like a true fiend. So another one that's going to be far too sweet, I'm probably going to be in a diabetic coma in 45 minutes. And to round it off, I've got a Northern Monk Wasted Christmas Pudding Festive Porter. So just to finish off the crappy Christmas beers at 5%. And... I can't be bothered to read it. I'm just going to drink it. I'm going to start with that one anyway, so I'm just going to pop my can and then we'll crack on into some talking points about the dark. We've got ourselves set up a, a paranormal investigation mystery. It's more sedate initially, even though there are some nasty bits. And we have some vignettes setting up characters, but a lot of the dark incidents happen off screen for a change and we hear reports about them from the police for example for a while at least and after about 60 pages he really starts to dig into these vignettes we discussed a rough agenda for this and we thought right everybody pick maybe three james herbert-esque vignettes that leap off the page as talking points so graham you're first on my screen what's the first of yours the first one is a is an incidental. But there's a chap. I forget which chapter. There's a chapter where they, he just kind of rattles through a load of things that have happened to these people that have been affected by the dark. And there's one 
that I, I kind of find, found amusing. It was about a pet shop owner who had killed all of his pets and then was walking through the streets with the boa constrictor wrapped around his neck that basically <laughs> strangled him. Yeah. And I just, I just thought as a throwaway, it was just literally a few, a couple of lines. That was it. I just thought that was quite uh, an interesting throwaway um, vignette. Yeah, there are quite a few. And I suppose what we, should, what we should probably point out as well for listeners is the setup isn't just a paranormal investigation, but actually a cult mass suicided in a house called Beechwood on Willow Road. And our protagonist, Bishop, goes in there and finds all these dead bodies. And I think he finds one person alive who tries to kill him. Can't remember. It's 300 pages ago. But that's essentially the setup. But strange things start happening around Willow Road. And this darkness that affects people's minds, kind of in a similar way to how the fog sent people potty. But, you know, it's different because it's the dark, not the fog. This starts to happen. So this kind of madness starts to creep out. And at some point, there is a... There is one night where everything goes crackers down Willow Road, and we get that described to us by a, a couple of police officers who were having having the discussion. But Miles, what's your first Herbertism? Oh, let me just pull out my book. It was a scene concerning a uh, Benjamin who is a bedridden OAP and Julie his nurse. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, um. Julie has been administering treatments to Benjamin, which are definitely above and beyond your general NHS practice. Maybe that's the um, the vaunted um, private health care that Rishi Sunak mm. uh, praises so much. And she's very much just sleeping with him for his money, mm. which he doesn't have and is planning to die about leaving her assent. And he has her stripped for him with many references to to breasts in the most unerotic ma um, manner possible, demands she dance for him, and then she promptly chokes him to death with her hair. That was the the first moment that kind of made me uh, pay attention of, of yeah. the book. That's definitely a, a good set piece to start the horror going. Yeah, that was one of my talking points as well. And when it comes to Herbert treating us to some of his odd proclivities there are there are a couple of marvelous pieces of language there well one's not marvelous one is pretty dull and uninspired um because he talks about her ample swellings you know th that's th that's not nearly as good as one further down the line towards the end in fact but there is a point where and what is it about herbert and boobs you know more than adequate gazongas. What are you going to say? He, he, I don't know if he's like Bob Monkhouse with his book of jokes, where James Herbert just had a, a, a notebook with different ways of describing breasts. But the single best piece of language in there is when she mounts him and she thinks to herself that it's like Doe being forced into an open purse. <laughs> Which is... Good God. But... Interestingly, Julie is found wandering the streets, isn't she, in kind of a daze? Yeah. So this becomes a theme throughout the book that people are affected overnight, then the following day they all that they either become dazed or they, they might only have dim or no memories of what went the night before. But this is early days yet. Graham, what's your next herbertism? The the next scene is a couple and their I think it's the the wife's parents in a car yeah. and they pull up to a petrol station i think the guy's called hugh possibly i can't quite remember and uh, they've just been to a ballroom dancing competition or yes. some sort of dance ballroom competition dancers, yeah and uh the husband's just getting hassled all the time by his wife and the, the father-in-law is sort of sticking up for him and it's just this sort of petty bickering going on at this uh petrol station and then it all goes horribly wrong when basically they get their car set on fire. Or, well, more than that, the petrol nozzle gets put into the car and they get sprayed with it. And it's quite, quite a horrific scene, I think. Mm. This was quite an odd one, I thought, because there's a couple of occasions when I'm reading this where I sometimes think that, did James Herbert actually grow up in Britain or London? <laughs> this, this, this happened as well with the football scene. Yeah. And they, they pull up and wait for someone to come and fill their car up. And this is the 80s, and I don't remember in the north of England 
there being petrol stations around where you pulled up and someone came out mm. and gave you service in that respect. I mean, it's terrible for them because the, the guy who comes out and gives them service isn't the guy who ran the petrol station. He's back inside with his head cracked open mm. and this mad person puts the petrol nozzle in the car and douses them and then sets them on fire and then sets himself on fire. But there are odd occasions where I'm reading James Abbott and I'm thinking, it sometimes yeah. reads like an American author it's, writing a British scenario. It's, it's interesting because there, there is, there's, a, there's a place near here, near where I live, where there is an attendant to the pump uh, and you just drive up and he does yeah. it for you. Um, right. I don't know whether it's because of Herbert's you know, being in Sussex or I don't know if it's a Sussex thing, but mm. but that yeah. is that there is one round here that, that happens. Yeah, possibly so then. Whereas in the north of England, they just go get out and do it yourself, you lazy bastard. Yeah, okay, fair play. Yeah. So speaking about that soccer stadium scene, did you have this one down as one of yours, Miles? I, I did. I, I admit I was a bit too young for the uh the Hills was it Hillsborough? Yeah. In the this reminded me of like everything I've seen reported about Hillsborough, like the Murdoch tabloid press but i was just too young for it yeah and it's it's just very kind of gruesome it reminds me of of a bit in uh the of quatermass the the 70s john mills yes speaking about unco speaking about dystopian uncozy catastrophes Mm. that's that's another good example actually that we didn't mention and just like the the escalation of it going from the players to the stadium to the the spectators and just a crushing mountain of flesh Mm. And and a, and a football player called Animal, which was a bit of a amusing side note. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is uh, another example of. I was reading it, thinking maybe things were different in the south of England. I don't know, but I do wonder if James Herbert ever actually went to a game of football <laughs> because one of the players described one of one of the fans is thinking to himself, and he uses the word soccer. Number one. Number two, one of the problems is caused by an away fan in the home end. Now, I used to go to Hull City games in the early 80s when I was probably from the age of nine through to 13, 14. I used to go with a group of school friends. And the whole thing about the press and all that stuff is is um, does ring true because in those days, everything was fenced off. And it's, it's, it's easy to forget now, but we used to go and it was all terrace. The fences were 10 feet tall between the front row of fans and the pitch, which is... When I think back and think about what it was like, it was it's, it, you have to pinch yourself, really, because you just take it for granted now that you sit at the edge and there's nothing. But there were fences between you and the, and the, and the pitch and the players. But not only that, there were 30-foot-high fences between the away fans and the home fans. And I can distinctly remember being at Hull City playing, I think we were playing Middlesbrough. And we normally sat in, I think it was the south stand at the old Boothbury Park. So we were at the opposite end to the away fans. The away fans would all be... Like, um, put into this area that had no roof. So, if it was raining, they got pissing wet through. But there was <laughs> one bit where you got the bigger teams who had the bigger at- away attendances. They would separate, they had a separated off part of, I think it must have been the East Stand with these fences that went up about 30 feet. And I can remember Middlesbrough fans climbing the fences, spitting through it, like almost like apes climbing the fence, spitting, people throwing coins at them. At the back of that stand was an old railway siding, that actually where fans used to get off a train. Boothry Park, Boothry Park had its own platform. And there would be fans running up and down those stands, having running battles. We, When we left, we were like 12, 13-year-old kids getting the call it kettling now, I think they called it kettling in those days, but getting kettled by lines of police horses. So I was reading this thinking, this is so quaint, the idea that you've got this big, beefy, away fan, topless with a scarf wrapped, tied around his... It all, It was all a bit a bit cod and a bit cheesy, but the, the actual violence that ensues was really quite alarming. And another thing that comes from this as well is we find that once they've opened the stadium, got everybody out, lots and lots of these people are involved in these crushes and these presses disappear into the city. And loads and loads of them are MIA. Some of them are found wandering, dizzy and confused. Others just disappear. And we don't know at this point where all these people are disappearing to. So there are some quite interesting things in the book. And there's some nice world building, actually, because we've got these... Um, is it the Metaphysical Research, research Group? Metaphysical research group, yeah, which yeah. they're kind of mentioned, but then that kind of they, they, nothing gets done with it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. 
but th there's an interesting synchronicity here. A friend of mine who does, he buys and sells stuff uh, from all, he goes to sort of house clearances and finds old barns and, and things like that. And he found not that long ago, a thing from the Mes metaphysical research group, which was effectively a, a lump of wood, nicely made into sort of a, almost like a synthesizer type thing with loads of dials on it. Yeah. And it was used by them. They're, they're from Hastings, I think. They're still going. And it was used by them to enable people to sort of channel stuff and, and do stuff like that. Um, so when I read that, I was like, oh, God, it's, you know, I know about that. Mm -hmm. And also they they make um, pendulums out of beech wood. So I think, right. hence the name of the the um, the house, I believe. I'm, I'm guessing. Oh, but yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Ah, interesting connections. That metaphysical research group, however, there's there's a, a bit where Bishop they've been doing some bits and pieces, and he goes home and he and he makes himself a dinner, and it says um, he cooked and ate a lonely dinner, then settled down to work for the rest of the evening. A publisher was interested in a new book he had planned and had already agreed a small advance on production of a synopsis. Bishop's idea was to write a detailed study on the many occult associations that were now thriving in different parts of the world. Organisations as varied as the Institute of Parapsychology and Cybernetics Incorporated in Texas, the Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man in North Carolina. A list of all these associations and societies had been drawn up by him, but he would have to sift through and choose those he would major on, for there was no possibility of visiting every place in person, and indeed, some were behind the Iron Curtain, and access to them might prove difficult. Several of these, however, sounded intriguing. The Czechoslovak Coordination Committee for Research in Telepathy. The, Czechoslo <laughs> the Czechoslovak Coordination Committee for Research in Telepathy, Telgnosis, Telgnosis, and Psychokinesis, and the Bioelectronics section of the Polish Copernicus Society of Naturalists were just two he was determined to see for himself. I want more on these. I want, I want like crusty old academics fighting over research pages in uh in journals uh that's all great stuff there is quite a lot of really nice world building stuff in here mm. do you think um herbert had an idea of making such a such a book a research book you know a lot of the stuff in here is definitely especially some of the lengthy musings on the on the nature of the dark especially when um jacob kulek is talking later in the book when they have the not the committee the convention or whatever yeah. it is in at Birmingham NEC. <laughs> the Home Secretary invites them and some of these other organisations to go and chew all this over while London every night is getting more and more <laughs> fucked up because of all this stuff that's going on. And he, he definitely seems to do a lot of thinking and a lot of his own research on a lot of this stuff. And I do think this book was definitely shows itself as a transitional book between his older hardcore, gruesome, catastrophe stuff, and his later books. Because he did The Rats, he did The Fog, but then he's doing books like The Survivor, which is a classic ghost story. He does uh, Fluke, which is about reincarnation. The Jonah, I can't really remember too much about, but it's fairly low-key. It's more of a vaguely supernatural thriller. And then he's doing things like um, the, the Magic Cottage, Moon, which is about a serial killer with a slight supernatural angle to it. So this definitely feels like a transitional book. And, and it almost feels like when he's entering into these like massive narrative pieces of exposition and explanation about these organizations and about all this other stuff, it seems like he's really building himself a platform to do a lot of this stuff. But what it makes me think is a lot of the stuff you're reading in here, if you get some of these modern role-playing games like Liminal hmm. by Paul Michener and, and things like that, the, some of the stuff in here is perfect fodder for these kind of um, role-playing games are, you know, some of this, you could, you could read it and it could just be the introduction or background to some of this stuff. It's all great stuff, but it does slow things down a little bit compared to his earlier work, but it is nevertheless really fascinating. And it really, it builds a picture of, of this, this world that's going on. And we, we talked about the devil, the D-Day on the last couple of episodes where Graham Masterson throws these things in there. In this, Herbert's throwing them in there and then expounding upon them for two pages and holding up the plot and holding up the progress of the book so you can just have these massive explorations of what's going on while someone's just eating spaghetti on toast and thinking about it. Yeah, so whilst it slows the book down a little bit, it's still really good stuff. Yeah. It's really good. It's good content, yeah, I suppose, it is. is one way of putting it. And it's kind of an interesting 
scene, isn't it? Where it's kind of just breaks things up. He's mm-hmm. just gone home, made some food, just doing a bit of work whilst everything else is going on around him. Yeah, right. and that we we do get a a little bit of a stopping point and and a, a summary of where things have got to. Bishop has a dream, and it says uh, Bishop worked late into the night, outlining the structure of his thesis drawing up a short list of associations he would include, making a note of their locations and any specific field of the paranormal they were involved in. It was well past one when he went to bed and sleep quickly claimed him. The nightmare returned and he was once again sinking into the black brooding depths of the ocean, his lungs crushed by the pressure, his limbs stiff and useless, his body's leaden weight dragging him below. At first was waiting for him down there. It was a man he recognised yet did not know. The man was grinning and withered lips called Bishop's name. His eyes seemed to bulge unnaturally from their sockets, and Bishop saw there was nothing but evil in them, a cold, mesmerising darkness that sucked him in, that drew him into a blackness that was even deeper than the ocean. The grin was a sneer, and Bishop suddenly knew it was the same man he had seen in Beechwood, the man who had watched his followers kill each other and themselves before putting a gun in his own mouth. The lips parted, yellow, ill-formed teeth guarding the glistening cavern inside. The fleshy, quivering tongue, the fleshy, quivering tongue resting on the entrance floor like a huge slug waiting to curl around and engulf any intruder. <laughs> Bishop floated through, the jaws closing behind him with a thunderous, steely clang, and he was totally blind and screaming. The soft, enveloping surface of the tongue reaching up for him and moulding itself around his feet. He tried to tug himself free, but only sank further into the gripping slime. And in the darkness, he sensed the tongue curling round, rearing over him to descend upon his shoulders. His own panic-stricken screams deafened him as white, floating shapes came into view, rising from the tunnel that was the man's throat. Their faces familiar, the images of those who had died in Beechwood. Dominic Kerkhope's with them. Oh, fuck me. I think that beer's glued my mouth together. <laughs> Dominic Kerkhope was with them, and so was Lynn. His eyes were wild, both terror and beseeching in them. Her lips formed words that were cries for help. She begged him, she pleaded, help me, and he couldn't. The tongue was pressing down on him, smothering his head and shoulders, choking him with its sticky juices, <laughs> forcing him to fall, crushing him in a cushion of softness until everything exploded. And he was the bullet smashing its way through the man's brain. The man he suddenly knew was Boris Prislak. He awoke screaming, but no sounds came from his lips. It was light outside, and he almost wept with relief. We've got two forces at work, haven't we? One is the dark presence, or whatever it is, acting like the fog which seems to be Prislak, or Prislak's consciousness, or Prislak's evil. And then we've got Prislak's cultists, and they are a tricky, tricky bunch, because we've just had that reference to Lynn, of course, who we've not mentioned, who is Bishop's wife, who we know from early on had some form of mental health issues, had a breakdown, and is now in a nursing home for the mentally unwell. And we've not got through all three of your um, herbatism or vignettes at the moment, but I just wonder if the mental home is one of them, because it was one of mine. It was, but not in the way you might be expecting. Um, the scene where he, where Bishop gets called in late at night because something happened with his wife. My wife has had some health issues a few years ago, so she spent a little bit of time in and out of hospitals. And just that was the one kind of moment where the book, felt kind of generally unsettling because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I could really relate to being caught, you know, being called up to a hospital room at very short, very short notice. Mm. And of course she's been taken over by the dark and become one, become like one of the cultists and then gets killed. Like so suddenly I thought it was going to be a fake out. Yeah. And she was going to turn up like towards the end of the book. Yeah. to try and kill our heroes, but nope, she's immolated right there and then. Yeah, it's quite horrific, isn't it? You know, the... Just in time for him to get with uh, Jessica. Yeah, it's quite quite convenient. There is a reference a little bit further on that he's traumatised by it, but then it's pretty much forgotten. But he's, he's fine. Yeah. The whole mental health nursing home scene I found quite effective for two reasons. One is we get our first real... Introduction to Tall Lady and Sharp Plump Lady, the villains, and how just horribly villainous they are. We have another example, um, I think two podcasts running, where doctors and nurses come out of things really fucking badly. And as a mental health nurse myself who's worked in these kind of establishments of these kind of settings, oh, terrible, terrible. I could have been on the end of that in the, well, in the 90s. 
But yeah, unfortunately, nurses and doctors uh, come a cropper quite badly in that. But it's the first time it starts to feel like almost like a zombie setup. Yeah. And definitely. I think there is actually a reference to zombie towards the yeah. end. In the in the, the council flat scene later yeah. on, it becomes like a zombie action movie almost. And this is like a crazy action scene. So this nurse and train um, home trap, Bishop gets out of it thanks to, and he barely is able to register them because he's so badly injured. Although he's not that badly injured once the rest of the book carries on. But we do find out that there are weeks going by. We get little reminders there are weeks going by. We get Ted and Mike. And Ted and Mike save him by wading in with pistols and blowing away <laughs> lots of these affected patients and managing to drag him out oh. and throw him out of a window. And I was reading, I was, it just, it's just like all of a sudden the, the professionals yes. come, exactly, come and rescue him. That's exactly what I had in my head when I was reading it. Yeah. It's like Bodie and Doyle. Just... Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And it's Ted and Mike. Um, and they're absolutely amazing. And we never hear from them again. It's just that's they the just most... turn up. Ted and Mike, the rescue him in his brilliant action scene, and then we never hear from him again. Absolutely fantastic. Want to want to read the doc from Ted and Mike's point of view because like there's probably a lot of action going on in that film. It's Ted and Mike yeah. on another crazy adventure. It is such a shame James Herbert is deceased because if we could have written him a fan letter saying, "Please, can you do a side quill?" to the dark from ted and mike's perspective <laughs> and somehow make simpson the police driver one of their <laughs> mates that would have been absolute magic and we'll get on to simpson because he's amazing as well as all this is happening then um, i don't know it's a little bit later but the old professor he explains the deal with the prislak cult and it's quite interesting because herbert philosophizes about evil as an energy force and there's some quite good stuff in there as well. Let me just look at the yeah, sod it. I'll, uh, I'll I'll read some of this because it's uh, it's quite nice. And he's he's made the effort, so you know what? Let's take a look at it. Let's have a look. So Kulek is explaining all of this to Inspector Peck because we've met Inspector Peck now. Who uh, we've got Peck and his his um, his sidekick Roper. We don't really find so much about Roper, although he does turn up to save the day at one point, and he's very very pragmatic, broad, Cockney copper, but. Kulak explains to Peck the relationship with Boris Prislak. And he says, When Boris Prislak came to enlist my assistance some years ago, he told me he was a man who did not believe in the existence of God. For him, science was the key to mankind's salvation, not religion. Disease and deprivation were being overcome by technology, not by prayer. Our economic and social advances were achieved by science. The decision to create new life was now our own. Even the gender of the newborn would one day be decided by ourselves. Death itself, if not entirely thwarted, could at least be delayed. Our superstitions, our prejudices and our fears were steadily becoming obsolescent in the face of new scientific discoveries. World wars had been virtually eradicated not because of divine intervention, but because we, ourselves, had created weapons too fearsome to use. Old barriers had been broken down, new barriers smashed through by mankind's own ingenuity, not by some superior being in the heavens. Prislak claimed that one day we would even discover scientifically how we gained that ingenuity, how, in fact, we were not created by a mystical someone, but created ourselves. We would prove by science that there was no God. Kulak's words were said calmly, his voice soft and even, but Peck could feel Prislak's madness in them. It was the cold logic of a fanatic, and Peck knew these were the most dangerous kind. The blind man went on. Yeah, we haven't mentioned Kulak blind. So, if there was no God... There could be no devil, yet as a pragmatist, Prislak could not deny the existence of evil. Through the centuries, religious and mystical leaders had always played on the superstitions and the ignorance of their fellow men. The church had always insisted that Satan was a reality. For them, it helped to prove the existence of God. Freud had confounded the church and demonologists alike by explaining that each of us had been through a phase of individual development corresponding to that animistic stage in primitive man, that none of us has traversed it without preserving certain traces of it which can be reactivated. Everything which now strikes us as uncanny fulfills those vestiges of animistic mental activity within us. You're saying that somewhere in here, Peck tapped his temple, is part of us that still wants to believe in all this evil spirits nonsense. Freud said this, and in many respects I believe he was right. In thousands of cases where ecclesiastical exorcists have tried to rid disturbed men and women of so-called diabolic possessions, rational examination has revealed a varied range of psychoses in those same people. 
Philosophers such as Schopenhauer advocated that evil sprang from man's fear of death, his fear of the unknown. It was man's will to survive that brought conflict to the world and within himself, but his own iniquity had to be blamed on something, someone else. Satan provided the ideal psychological scapegoat. In the same way, because of the adversities inflicted on man throughout life, and because he knows his own inadequacies, man needed a god, a superior, someone who would help him, someone who, in the end, would provide the answers, someone who would pull him through. Unfortunately for the church, the age of rationality is here. Perhaps one could say that education has been the greatest enemy of religion. The edges have become blurred, questions are being asked. How could atrocities be committed to achieve right? Wars, killings, executions. How could bad acts achieve good? How could men the world knew to be evil claim God was on their side? Would a civilised country ever fight a religious war again? In the late seventies, who had been the more evil? The dictatorial Shah of Persia, or the religious fanatic Ayatollah Khomeini, who overthrew him? Idi Amin claimed to have conversed with God several times. Hitler claimed God was on his side. The persecution of so-called heretics throughout the centuries by the church itself had still not been answered. This dichotomy has been challenged, and Prislak saw it as man's recognition of his own powers, a predetermination over his own destiny. He had discovered his own original sin and decided it wasn't as evil as the church had always taught him. Satan has now become a source of ridicule, of entertainment even, a comical myth, a bogeyman, and evil came from man alone. Prislak believed it was a physical energy field within our mind, and, just as we were learning to use our psi faculties, energies such as telekinesis, extrasensory perception, telepathy, telegy, so we could learn to use physically this other power. Kulek paused as if to allow the two policemen's thoughts to catch up on all he had said. I think Prislak developed his concept into a proven fact. He located this source of energy and used it. I believe he is using it now. That's impossible, said Peck. Many things in your own lifetime that you once thought impossible have been achieved by science, and knowledge in every field of technology is an escalation. Man has accomplished more in the last hundred years than in the previous thousand. But for Christ's sake, Prislak is dead! I think he had to die, Inspector. It's my belief that Boris Prislak and his followers have become the energy. Peck shook his head. I'm sorry, you know I can't buy all this. Kulek nodded. I didn't expect you to. I just wanted you to hear a theory I'm convinced is true. You may have cause to reflect upon it over the next few weeks. The madness will get worse, Inspector. It will spread like a disease. Every night there will be more who succumb to its influence, and the more minds it takes, the stronger it will grow. It will be like the raindrops on a window pane. One small drop will run into the one below, then both into the one below that, growing in size and weight, until it's a fast-flowing rivulet. Why night time? Why do you say these things only happen when it's dark? I'm not sure why it should be so. If you read your Bible, you'll see evil is constantly referred to as darkness. Perhaps that terminology has more significance than we thought. Death is darkness, hell is the dark, fearful underworld. The devil has always been known as the Prince of Darkness, and isn't evil expressed as the darkness in one's soul? It could be that this darkness is a physical ally to the manifestation of this energy. Perhaps the biblical concept of the constant battle between light and darkness is a true scientific concept. Whatever energy light rays contain, be they from the sun or artificial, it may be that they counteract or negate the catalytic qualities of darkness. Prislak has fared much of this at our last meeting, and I must admit that although I often found his ideas fascinating, this time I thought there was some madness in his thinking. Now I'm not so sure. Kulak's frame seemed to relax imperceptibly in his chair, and Peck realised the blind man's disquieting statement was over. He looked at each individual in the room and noticed even Roper's secretive smirk had disappeared. You realise everything you just told me is totally useless to my investigation, don't you? <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. So, he's like, Peck's like, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. But it's uh, a good example of how I think Herbert's really struggling. I think he's really enjoying writing this, but there's a little bit of a, a struggle going on between... And, and Actually, although I do think this is reflected very much in parapsychology anyway, of that struggle between science, technical fact, and theology. And I absolutely understand Peck's frustration <laughs> with all. But it's, again, it's, uh, it's kind of good detail. In chapter 20, we get a really interesting chapter where you get Peck's perspective and like a summary of incidents, similar to the police conversation about the Willers Road incidents earlier on, that in that chapter, Peck is thinking about it. And let me have a look. 
He's sat there having a fag. Yeah, my God. He's sitting and he's reading a report and it says, what the fuck is going on? He asked himself. The football incident had been the biggest so far, but there had been others just as alarming. The burning down of the Fairfield rest home for one. The riot in the boys' remand home for another. The little bastards had turned on the wardens and then on themselves. Sixteen dead, twenty-four terribly injured. The rest. Where were the rest? The inmates of another mental home, this one run by the National Health, therefore known more accurately as a hospital for the insane, had turned on the staff first and then, as with the boys' home, themselves. Fortunately, the alarm had been raised before too much damage was done, but five were dead, two nurses, three patients, before the police had arrived in force. The mystery was why several of the staff had joined in the riot. There had been many similar incidents, and if anything, some of these were even more disquieting than the major events. Perhaps it was because they had involved perfectly normal people, at least considered to be normal, before they had committed their individual acts of madness. A man had slaughtered every animal in the pet shop he owned, afterwards taken to his bed with the one fortunate creature he had spared, the showplace of his collection, a ten-foot-long South American boa constrictor. That's the one, Graham. Yeah. He had been found dead with a snake wrapped around his throat like a muffler. Three nuns had gone berserk in their convent, creeping through the corridors one night and attempting to smother several sleeping sisters with pillows. They had succeeded twice before they were discovered. A doctor on night duty, the inquiry discovered he had worked non-stop for two days and nights, had toured the wards of his hospital injecting patients with a lethal dose of insulin. Only the intervention of a duty nurse had prevented more than a dozen deaths. She herself had been injected and killed when she had struggled with the doctor. What fucking nurses are getting no luck? No luck in this book at all. A labourer, working late to finish an urgent job on a block of offices that was undergoing modernisation, had knocked his foreman semi-conscious, then pinned into the wall with a nail gun. The gun individually shot six-inch nails with a force strong enough to pierce concrete, and by the time the other workman got to the unfortunate foreman, his arms and legs were firmly pinned. The crazed workman managed to fire a nail through his own head before they could get to him, and another labourer had narrowly missed being punctured when the nail had emerged from the other side without losing any impetus. But perhaps the most bizarre of all, and my favourite, Perhaps the most bizarre of all was the butcher who had served his chopped-up wife to his customers. Today's special, regular customers only. A section of thigh... <laughs> a section of thigh was still missing. And the police were desperately trying to trace the unlucky housewife who'd made the bargain purchase. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. That sounds like a League of Gentlemen sketch in and of itself. It does. I really love these kind of summaries because you get these things and I can imagine when James Herbert's sitting down and writing his outline for his book, he'll sketch out lots of these horrific incidents. But on this occasion, so far, and we're close to 200 pages in, we've had very few of these vignettes that essentially fill up two thirds of his other books up until this point. And just having these summaries, it leaves it to the imagination. And there's, there's one later on where there's a simple reference to it reaching Wandsworth Prison, but it doesn't elaborate on it. And then a few pages later, you get maybe one or two sentences saying what went down in Wandsworth. It's really effective. But at this point, he thinks, oh, I haven't done any vignettes for ages. And he goes vignette crazy for, for like a chapter or two. But we get one from a cat's perspective, which is nice. And it's only about a page and a half long. So it's cat's perspective, look, rooting through bins. And then we get some unfortunate sewer engineers and that's pretty good because it actually does, it establishes some additional stuff about what's going on with these people because these sewer engineers find out where a lot of these people have been disappearing to. They're all hiding down in the sewers. Some of them aren't feeding themselves. Some of them are really emaciated because they're going down. They are effectively behaving like zombies for want of a better expression. And then we get, these vignettes start to really slow it down for me. There's some good stuff, like there's a siege at Kulek's house where tall lady and short, dumpy, plump breast lady lead an attack on the house. That's really, really good. But then we get we get bogged down in, I think there's a four or five page vignette on like a Jonestown style yeah, religious yeah. cult in London, which I'm sure when Herbert thought this will make a really good vignette, it might have done at another place in the book, but this, this book should be rattling towards an exciting climax now. And that's like five pages long and it doesn't add anything to the plot. It doesn't add any, because actually this cult, that we're going to do it anyway. It's nothing to do with the dark. They're just, you know, they're just a, 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 a religious sect. Uh, what else is there? There's, there's the, the pub landlord and landlady one is amusing simply because, and again, it doesn't really add anything whatsoever. But we do get another opportunity for an amusing Jabs Herbert 
boob reference when he writes, Sheila rested her elbows on the bar top and stared reflectively at the locked door. A fresh cigarette dangled from her lips, and her large breasts lay comfortably on the bar's wooden surface like full sacks of graded flour. How do you even <laughs> mentally sit and look at a pair of tits and, and think about the sacks of graded flour? So odd. Uh, but th there's, there is another one of the vignettes which, again, does add a little bit of detail to the dynamics of what's going on. And it's a guy who's headed out in the night to find the dark and let it take him. Turns out it's a Labour MP. And he finds out there's many others like him. And they go out there into, into the darkness, hoping that the dark will find them, and it doesn't. And they're deflated and let down the following morning. And they go home in disappointment and wait to just try again the following evening. And we find out when they're at this conference in Birmingham convened by the Home Secretary. And I've got to say, this chapter is as boring as an actual conference. But we do find out that although the dark is in London, people from all over the country are headed there, attracted to it. And there are directives in London to have all lights on overnight, like a reverse of World War II. But people are actually flouting them because there's almost like a, a subconscious desire to taste the dark. Reminded me a little bit of um, the Purge films, where it's like, you know, once darkness comes, most people, a lot of people just want to lock themselves inside and hide, but some people want to go outside and indulge in what's going on. But at this conference, they agree a plan. And we've got to talk about this plan. What do you make of the plan to go to Beechwood? Insanity. It's a fucking terrible plan, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. It's an absolutely yeah. terrible plan. On one level, I like the vision <clears throat> of a seance taking place surrounded by army trucks and arc lights and generators. But on the other hand, if I was Edith Metlock, I'd have told him to fuck right off. Yeah. Because yeah. the plan is, Edith, why don't we go and do a seance and you pull the darkness into your psyche so we can, I don't know, do something with it? It's pretty loose. It's a pretty loose yeah. plan. A uh, plan with no drawbacks whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. does go <laughs> horrifically wrong. <laughs> it goes horrifically wrong. Because, of course, the cult have foreseen this plan and they've foreseen the plan around things like, you know, lighting at London. So one of the cult has a handy counter to this, which is to deactivate the power in half of London. So London is plunged into darkness. And at this point, when they've got the plan to go to Beechwood, I was thinking, right, I've, I've been enjoying on a certain level some of these vignettes. Some of them have really been getting in the way. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, shit, there's another 60 pages to go. So obviously this, <laughs> this, uh, this seance isn't going to go according to plan. But in a way, that's a good thing. Because much like the end of the fog, we end up getting a mad car chase through the blacked-out city avoiding and or ramming groups of murderous Londoners. And we get the books, for me, the book's MVP, which is the police driver, Simpson, who was fucking awesome. Not only is he driving a Ford Granada through the blacked out streets of London, running over people affected by the dark or not affected by the dark. They don't really know. There's so much going on. There are people trying to escape the city in cars, getting it's pulled out of cars. It's absolute carnage. Eat you think that James Herbert had a really bad experience in London? <laughs> uh, because, like, this in the fog, James Herbert hates London. Yeah. And he, he hates <laughs> Londoners as well. Yeah. Well, he had, he had a the, bad time. The, there's also an interesting parallel with the end of the fog as well. I mean, they haven't got a devastation vehicle, sadly. If Simpson had a devastation vehicle, he'd have had an even better time. Because Best Simpson, novel ever. Simpson's having the time of his life. <laughs> doing all this but there's a, there's a point at which it's uh there's a reference to a woman being having her clothes pulled off on the bonnet of a car and then the crowd pulls in but they know what's going on so it all gets a bit rapey and bishop and jessica are like there's no way we can let this happen in the fog they mount the pavement and run over the, the would-be rapists in this, because it's the dark and it's the fog on steroids, Simpson's just like, there's no way we're getting involved in that morass of people. And at one point, Bishop is about to pull the gun on Simpson to make him stop and try and save this woman. Uh, but Simpson's having none of it because he's in full-on take charge mode. Ultimately, we have to say, sadly, RIP PC Simpson. Thoughts and prayers, he doesn't make it. That, that whole crazy scene in Blacked Out London with them just seeing... The carnage by headlight is really cool and really yeah, effective. And at that point, I was thinking, this book's getting on my tits now because it's going on too long. But I really, really enjoyed that passage. Yeah, that's a, I think at that point, I was in a similar frame of mind. I was, I was getting a bit, well, I was getting very sort of, it was dragging on. But at that point, things started 
starts to speed up again mm. and and it's the pace that i was expecting like you know of of, of herbert's books there's actually some action it was it was good fun it, it really does feel like two different books clashing with each other at times yeah yeah it's- having read this one after haunted it this does just feel like a middle ground between the fog where it is balls to the wall hits out dicks out everything spread out all over the street yep. to haunted and i feel that kind of just makes the book just never really works because it's trying to be one thing but you feel like like herbert's trying to going this is my brand yep. i have to kind of stick to what people expect of me right now even though i want to be going in this direction yeah um i i love when it gets to the the housing is the um the council flats building for the for the climax yeah yeah like that that's how some of my favorite bits in the, in the entire book yeah that's full-on action film tastic isn't it take it away tell us about the council flat well first first we have like the the maintenance guy who is looking for someone who keep like the old man who keeps pissing in his <laughs> lift <laughs> Yeah, uh, and the the lovely little bitch. I think is the, the most British cozy catastrophe moment, where they're knocking on when um, Bishop and Co are knocking on doors, trying to you know trying to find someone to cover them, and you get this old couple who's like, "We're not letting you. We're not letting you in." Yeah. <laughs> it it is the most quintessentially British part of the book, apart from the book part that's in the pub. Yeah, like those are the bits that made me feel a little bit homesick. Yeah, <laughs> the the old couple. Actually, that old guy, he's MVP number two, really, isn't he? <laughs> because we found out later on, even though he wouldn't let him in, which was absolutely sensible and the right thing to do, he continues to ring the phone line that never gets picked up. And he just keeps on trying again and again and again and again. And eventually a copper picks up and he gives him the message that gets to Peck. And Peck turns up the following morning to get him out. So that old guy, whilst he does exactly the right thing, not letting him in, is a top fella because he does what's required. But yeah, the um, the foreman or the, the, the janitor or whatever who goes up to tell the old guy off for pissing in the lift even though he denies it, mm-hmm. and then just kills them both and eats them. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a good aside with the janitor where it, it, just, it, it goes about when he's sort of talking about, when he's sort of reminiscing about sitting in the pub thinking he's put a bomb in the tower block. Yeah. So that it just just blow up and destroy all of the the people that are just annoying him so much. It's just uh, I, I like those things that Herbert puts in. Those sort of little aside things that yeah. gives you that sort of insight, a little bit of flavour. Yeah, it's really great. And as a standalone, I love it. But it's this mad action sequence that suddenly grinds <laughs> to a halt for a page and a half for him to tell you the story of the janitor, whereas really all you need is the punchline. Yeah. From the perspective of the pace of the book, all you need is the punchline. But he, 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 everything grinds to a halt while he does his page and a half vignette about the guy. It's great, but again, it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. a problem with like two different things clashing. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's another bit in that book that I absolutely sorry in that chapter that I absolutely adore, and it's as they're working their way up and they're knocking on doors and people out letting them in and they're looking down the stairwell and they can see that they're being followed up they come across some residents who were out on the hallway and the residents have said, oh, people are coming up. And then at one, they have some back and forth. At one point, the residents say, I'm absolutely sick of this. And they just decide to engage in open warfare <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the dark, afflicted people coming up the stairs. And it just breaks out into open warfare in the hallways. And there's a really sad reference and it's where, where Bishop thinks, it, Bishop's like, yeah, these people are, you know, stout people actually doing this what a shame some of the people coming out the flats are probably also affected by the dark and unfortunately they're not going to succeed in their efforts and it's like at one point it's like yeah come on and then it's oh yeah oh yeah this, this they're all gonna nope. die horribly but it's all left to the imagination because it's all just going on down below them as they make, as they work their way up it's a fantastic chapter really but they do get to the top and then kulek just this came out of completely out of the blue for me. Kulek went through the windscreen of the police car, but he's still alive, so they got him all the way up to the roof. And then he decides that the only way they can possibly deal with this is if he throws himself off the roof and kills himself, which is a a bit random, and a bit out of left field. But we do find out at the end why that is. But holy shit, after we do get a really satisfying death for the tall woman, where basically Bishop lobs her over the banister... <laughs> 
<laughs> and she goes all the way down, bouncing off things as she goes. That's really satisfying. Mini cheer for that. Tall woman was horrible. But then the pace goes absolutely glacial again for that final chapter. You have this massive crescendo of action. And then the final chapter is three weeks later, the redo, the seance. But this time Edith Matlock has got Kulex, Ghost, Stroke, whatever, to help focus her and and they solve the problem with a big burst of light. And now Bishop and Jessica are blind at the end. Well, they've got a child on the way, though. It will be blind too. Yeah. But she will also have psychic powers, and that makes it better? Yeah. Again, brilliant example of the conflict in this book. The second to last chapter is fucking brilliant. Builds to a really amazing crescendo. The last chapter, oh, all the air is let out of the balloon for that last yeah. chapter. I like the idea of them going blind and, and all that stuff. That's, you know, quite a good doing for the characters and for the relationship. But there had to be a way to resolve the conflict between those two those two things. But I guess, I mean, fuck that. I'm, I'm not James Herbert. James Herbert was a great writer and he made shitloads of money and he sold shitloads of books, so what the fuck do I know? But as a reader, I didn't feel satisfied. Yeah. It felt like there was two things going on and they didn't complement each other at all. Yeah. I was hoping this, this conflict between these two things would come to a nice plat at the end and, and have a satisfying conclusion. But that last chapter, I was like, I was, I was really like, yeah, it was hard <laughs> yeah. work, that last chapter. Uh, yeah, I, I found that last chapter, when after the tower block, and I sort of saw how many pages were left, I was thinking, how, how is this going to conclude? Mm. And then I, I sort of skipped to the end, but didn't read it, and then saw, in my version, it's all in italics, this last bit. And I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> Well, how's he going to get from normal to italics at that point? What, what? Yeah, it didn't tie up that no. well for me. No. no, I have a question for you both. In your for your last the section, which is all in italics, yeah, is there, is your chapter numbered or does it ju just say chapter? Just says chapter. Just says chapter. Okay, because I was looking, I was like, I wonder if that, I wasn't sure if that was like a printing yeah. error. If there was a printing error, where, well, none... where it becomes italics. Yeah, yeah. I have on man. It's thirty one. Then you get that long, fucking boring chapter that goes on for about 10 pages. And then when it switches to italics, there is no oh. cha chapter. Oh, no chapter. Chap it's just yeah. blank. One just says chapter. Yeah. 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 So I'm not, not sure what that's about, but I, I guess this is the first edition. So they must have changed something in the manual script, yeah. maybe. Chapter. Oh, uh, yeah. How odd. Oh. And which, which version do you have, Graham? I have. Um... So Matthew, Matthew, so uh, it's that. It's okay, got, all right. Yeah, it's got. Um, gotcha. Blue. Okay, so I think we have the same print. We I think we have the same print because I had the same one, which has I have a similar version. Yeah, which has um those same books. Right. Maybe it was just like the you know because it was just like a typesetting error. Mm. You know, this this is how exciting the end of the book is that we're going. <laughs> is there a printing <laughs> error in my copy? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, in in summary, good, entertaining, some pacing issues in the last third because he all of a sudden remembers that he likes writing vignettes, and it seems to be a bridge novel transitioning from his earlier ultra violent stuff into his uh, more new supernatural ghosty stuff like the Survivor, the Spear, although the Survivor came before this. So did the Spear actually, and things like the Magic Cottage haunted. I mean, eventually he's doing the secrets of Crickley Hall and. And all that stuff, and he's and he's got the ghosts of Sleeth, which that's another one, Miles. If you enjoyed Haunted, you'll enjoy okay. the Ghosts of Sleeth. I found Secrets See, of Crickley Hall a bit hard work, but the Ghosts of Sleeth is great. I, I admit to compare, go back to your review of the Fog. I wanted more. I wanted, and I was expecting more. I was expecting more Good Morning Kevin moments, and that's what yes. this book is. The book yeah. is lacking the insanity of some of those killings in the it in some of those killings in the fall, yeah. which makes that book a joy to read at work, let me tell you. <laughs> you're, just, you're just kind of standing at, at your desk kind of reading, and then they took the garden shares to, hmm, I was going to put this under here for right now. Yeah, although there but are no, moments in this which are as unpleasant. The but, shotgun moment on 80, shotgun fire yeah. moment on 80, yeah, for yeah. example. You're right, there isn't a good morning Kevin moment. No. That's a shame. No. Mm. But, hey. That was the dark. I 
I've got to say, I think it's a bit cheeky of them to refer to this dope fiend as cookie dough porter because it tastes like off rhubarb. Oh. So, yeah, that's my third wild child beer, and I won't be buying any more, that's for sure. Off rhubarb, that doesn't sound good. No, no. I'm, I'm going to force it down, don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm going to do it for everybody else's <laughs> sake. <laughs> anyway, so, when we started talking about this, we had had a couple of conversations, and we'll, we'll refer to uh, this book in a second, but I was trying to think of other examples by other authors of of stuff like this, because, of course, we've got, we've got Guy and Smith doing his Crabs novels, but I think... I've I've not read a lot of the Guy and Smith books that I've got on my shelf now. Some thanks to you, uh, Graham. But Very welcome. Are there any Graham Masterton? Sorry, are there any Guy and Smith books that really kind of fit this kind of mold? Yeah, there, there, there's, I've got a couple here that really do fit it. There's um, Throwbacks, which is about um, germ warfare, and then few people basically end up becoming primitive, turning into subhumans and just go rampage chaos. Um, there's Bats Out of Hell, which is, again, a sort of disaster, a catastrophe type thing. Warhead, which I haven't read yet, but this yes. is just absolutely bonkers <laughs> from all accounts, which um, I'm, I'm, that's, on, that's on next on my reading list. I've got um, it. I think you sent me a copy, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. When you, when you start reading it, let's do a read-along. Okay, yeah. And I will read it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because we, we've just got to compare notes on that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was also thinking about Graham Masterton, and there was one he did called Plague, which, oddly, Graham Masterton, despite the fact he was Scottish, and uh, I don't know if you listened to the last episode, Graham, but he was deputy editor of Mayfair at the age of 21, and at oh. 24, he was executive editor of Penthouse. <laughs> so the British horror author, Jazz Maglink, <laughs> yeah. is intact. Yeah, brilliant. It continues. But yeah, Plague was good. But un- un- unusually for one of these British authors, he sets a lot of his books in the USA. So right. you know, Manitou is another example, yeah, yeah. Which, we, which we looked at in the last show. But this one he wrote, Plague, was actually a really, really good kind of plague-based, end-of-world, terrible catastrophe story. But it's really, really let down by some pretty horrendous attitudes of of the time, in right. inverted commas about race and culture, which is a bit of a shame, kind of took the took the shine off it a little bit for me. And then, of course, one you recommended to me a while ago, The Furies. Oh, yeah. So, Miles, get this. Earthquake releases giant wasps that enslave humanity. What are they enslaving humanity for? Oh, they've got, they've got them building stuff. Oops. Oh, yeah. Quick, wait, wait are, are the ants, like, sentient, or are they still just... Uh- Big giant buzzing ants. No, they're wasps. Wasps, like big giant buzzing, like yeah, they're big. They, 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 do they talk? No. Or no, they. Just... Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a pretty good book, actually. It sounds bonkers, but it is. It's good. It, it is off its guard, frankly, <laughs> um, because these these massive donkey-sized wasps appear and start fucking everybody up. But as time goes by, they enslave people and make them dig wasp mountains, and it's it's all it's all quite confusing. Isn't that by Keith Roberts? Yeah, it's Keith Roberts. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I've read um, Havan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. Um, definitely has no giant donkey-sized wasps in it. But now I have to check and track this one down. <laughs> yeah. Hell. It's, it's really it's really puzzling when you get to the point where the wasps have got people in work camps. And and they're making people do things, and it's and then some of the rebels get out and create little caves and enclaves where they where they launch guerrilla attacks on on the wasp establishments. And towards the end, the wasps have got this incredible structure, and they've got a guy who is like a suit wearing administrator who works on behalf of the wasps. It's it's so out there. It's amazing. And I think it must have been an influence on the War of the Wasps trailer that was on In Bed with Dean Lerner. The, uh, the Matthew Holness <laughs> and Richard, Richard Ayoade and Matt Berry thing. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's well worth a read. Graham recommended it to me and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. There's a crazy car in it as well. So. There is. You know what? Done. I, I have literally <laughs> purchased it just now. <laughs> admittedly, admittedly on Kindle, but um, done. Done. Wonderful. Okay. 
So, are there any others? Well, there are any others, because I've just mentioned Fugue for a Darkening Island that you both have read. I got a copy of Fugue, and I got the revised copy ah. of Fugue. And um, from his intro to the revised Golanx edition, Christopher Priest said, This version of Fugue for a Darkening Island is fully revised. I've wanted a chance to modify the book for many years for a number of reasons. The main one was that as time went by, sensibility about, sensibilities about the subject matter began to change, attitudes to it changed, even the vocabulary of it changed. The story, which I saw as an attempt to describe a global disaster in the ironic and liberal terms of its day, gradually became misunderstood. So I bought them both, intending to read them both, and of course they just went on my to-read pile and got buried. But, Graham, tell us about Fugue for a Darkening Island. It's... um. I found it really uncomfortable to read. So I've got the the original New England New English Library copy. Yeah. I found it really difficult to read and un- uncomfortable to read because of the subject matter. So it's about sort of immigration and boat people basically coming to the the UK and it does feel quite racist but yeah. reading it. Of course but, when we, when we were kids at that time, Vietnamese boat people was a, yeah. was a big thing in like the yeah, yeah. consciousness, wasn't it? Yeah, and here, and here we are, boat people. It's we're we're exactly the same fucking place again. Everybody, yeah. the news is talking about boat people. But sorry, I interrupted. Do go on. Yeah, no, no. It's um, but the I guess the the reason I found it really uncomfortable is, is the main character. I forget the main character's name. Um, he's just not very nice. Mm. He's he's not pleasant at all. He's not a nice person. So you're reading reading along about his. It sort of skips, similar to um, um, my, my mind's gone fuzzy. Similar, yeah. Anyway, it skips backwards and forwards to you know his past life and his current life, where things in the UK are basically they're breaking down. Law and order's breaking down. There's factions. There's different political groups, um, and he's just travelling around, just having a not a very nice time. He's lost his wife and daughter and. Well, they've they've sort of disappeared, and but he wasn't really pleasant to them anyway. He was just, it, I don't know, Mars. What did you think? I, I enjoyed I, it, but it was ho- I, not nice. I read it, and you know, it was the first finished book of two thousand twenty three, so it can only, you know, it can only get up, it can only get better from here. Last year, first book I read last year was short, Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Come back, Terry Brooks. All is forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> like I am, I I am reading this in uh, a bookshop um, next to my workplace, and I'm just, I'm just mid. Like I haven't read a book in so long, where the act of reading the book just made me utterly fucking miserable. <laughs> because I am, I am reading this, and I'm going, I am surprised that uh, Stephen Bannon and Trump don't have this book on their favorite to read because I'm essentially reading like the last four years, like the last six years of American immigration policy combined of all the worst aspects of Bojo. And the main character, Alan Rittman, he feels like everything negative about the, the British archetype, which isn't like Dunkirk, you know, blitz spirit. It's more, I'll just sit, I'll just cover my head. I'll ignore it. I won't pick a side. And eventually the problem will just be sorted out mm. by other people. And it doesn't, it just gets worse and worse. And he yeah. ends up having to pick a side, but it ends it ends up just him becoming a monster because he just didn't care for 90%, 95% of the book. Yeah. It, it was just deeply unpleasant. Yeah. I don't think I've read anything this unpleasant in a long time. Yeah, and at the end, it was just there's when I finished it, I was I kind of stopped. I, I, yeah, finished the last page. And I was just like, you know, it's, yep. it's almost like you know, Requiem for a Dream in in that sense where you're watching it, it's just relentless, <laughs> and there's nothing pleasant about it. No, like but, the the book just ends with I got a gun and became a fascist. But, Two um, thumbs up, no comments. I'd, I'd be interesting to read the revised copy mm. to see well, to see. Because he went on to write some quite a lot he, of he wrote the, things. He wrote the Prestige, mm-hmm. yeah, which is a real, which is a really good book. Um, I haven't, I've never actually seen the film. I've just read the book. First Christopher Priest book I read was Dream of Wessex. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Which is a, which is a great book, actually. Which um, essentially prefigures virtual reality as a place that people don't want to leave. That's that's a really cracking book, and I really enjoyed the Prestige. But I've got to say, after listening to you two describe Fugue for a Darkening Island, um, I'm sure I should be repelled by it. But now all I want to do is read it. There's there's a kind of car crash mentality to what to reading the entropic breakdown like it is quint it is almost quintessential british new wave mm. in that way because it it does feel entropic is the best word it feels mm. like a it feels like the parts of a cure for cancer where society, where england is clearly breaking down into the anarchy you usually see in countries which are being bombed yeah. by western militaries yeah yeah it's you know, in in the Black Corridor, where there's the references of, of of the sort of chaos going on in the in the in Britain, Great Britain, yeah. and it's kind of that aspect in in the Black Corridor, but expanded on so massively, and the the main character is just so just awful, awful really. You you kind of you, there's nothing in him that you'd think. You know, I feel a bit sorry for him. You just mm. this, this person is just basically. Just on this sort of downward spiral, and you, you you're almost sort of hoping at, at in certain points that he's going to sort of pull himself back and and change, mm. but it just doesn't. And mm. the the crazy thing is, a, a lot of it's based around where it, based based around Sussex. There's a whole the ending bit is towards Worthing and Ferring, which is not far from where I am. The, so, the the boats arrive in the boats arrive in Brighton. Yeah, the initial boats arrive in Brighton. That's just kind of a weird. Might that this is a weird mind screw because it meant it mentions the it mentions the Western Pier, which I think would be have been like the chain pier, which was gone long before I was I was you know aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as as for a catastrophe book, it's it's, it's definitely not cozy. Mm. No, mm, yeah, no. I have, <laughs> have to move that one up my list. I mean, I think the last book I can remember reading and just being thoroughly miserable from beginning to end was the road and another oh, road. Oh. the road isn't one of our 1970s british uncozy catastrophe books but if you want an uncozy catastrophe book that's on a par or perhaps even exceeds any of these things then yeah, um, yeah i think the road is right up there i remember at the time it, i i had to look up the term catamite and and when uh when i looked it up i was like oh my god this is even worse than i thought it was <laughs> It's absolutely terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, and, and then you know the film doesn't do the book any justice. Yeah. That's for sure. I, I've not seen the film. I read the book. And if you'd never read the book and you watch the film, you think, "Oh, that was a pretty impressive piece of grim horribleness." Yeah. But it's it, it. For example, it doesn't go there with the catamites. Yeah. You know, um, they, they don't feature in the film at all. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an all right film. If you can get over the fact that it's murky as fuck and the cinematography is awful. But apart from that, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. But yeah, are, are there any other examples of 1970s uncozy catastrophes that you've read recently? Does the drowned world count? Because mm. I also recent, I recently reread the drowned world, like in the last month, I was going to read the crystal world, but I didn't feel like it at the time. So it back to the library. It went, so that's bad, um, isn't it? That's about that's Ballard, and I, I didn't. I, I don't think I really got it first time when I read it like years ago when I was first getting into the new wave writers. But second time round, I you know I really liked it. It does have some very nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties white British um, depictions of of race and um, African inhabitants in England. Well, on the whole, I really, I really enjoyed it. Hmm. So, what's the um, what's the um, the capsule description of Drowned World? Uh, essentially, um, solar flares have caused widespread climate change, which has turned huge parts of England and especially London into essentially African swampland. And you have a group of scientists who are trying to research it. And these treasure hunters turn up who want to kind of drain the lagoon that is the kind of swampland as London so they can get into the buildings to steal all the treasure. 
and you have the main character who's slowed in son to think you can't change you can't change this back you just have to mentally adjust to how the world is changing around us and not because he's with a group of english soldiers some of who are going mad because they're stuck in a situation they can't get out of and it's slowly becoming more and more unpleasant and less idyllic mm. it's it was uh, books I enjoy books I didn't get at 20 which I, I get far too well at age 39 <sighs> yeah that's another one I'll have to add to my list <laughs> I think I mentioned briefly with the death of grass earlier on I think that is a good example of I mean it's pre-70s obviously but it's a good example of how whilst Aldis might have been dismissive of John Wyndham the death of grass is pretty grim you know it's a situation where all species of grass die and that includes rice because I didn't, I didn't realize until I read that when I was at school that rice was a form of grass, but it is. There you go. But I haven't read it since I was at school, but I did watch the film and I bought it through Prime. Hmm. And it's called No Blade of Grass. And it's got Nigel Hawthorne hmm. walking around in a nice cream mac with an eye patch, leading people from London to the north of England where his brother has got a compound. And it's um pretty sleazy and unpleasant it's got uh wendy richards in it i.e pauline fowler and uh, a, f- a few other well-known actors including the actor the actor who married peter sellers when she was very very young and she died quite young from alcoholism maybe a drug overdose can't, can't remember the name of the actor um but she was also in phase four yeah yeah um, um... Lynn Fed. I'm actually looking up a prime right now. Uh, Lynn Frederick. Lynn Frederick. Yeah, and it's got crazy biker gangs. It's got um, old ladies with rifles being beaten to death by bikers. Old ladies with kitchen knives stabbing bikers. It's it's really really out there. It's directed by a guy called Carnell Wild who was uh, an American actor who did lots of westerns and war movies, and he directed a handful of films. One was a Pacific War movie, which is interesting. But they've got this... um, Whilst it was a a, a film made in Britain with, you know, decent British actors like Nigel Hawthorne, it's got a... I think these days, if you were talking about computer game, you talk about jank, don't you? Mm. Uh, Euro jank on European first person shoots and things like that. It's got that weird jankiness. Like sometimes there's there's an old couple sitting in a pub and their dialogue is really horrendously dubbed while they're <laughs> being incredibly racist about Chinese people on the television. It's um it's a really fascinating film that makes you feel dirty. <laughs> It's like an enjoyable post-apocalyptic <laughs> film that makes you feel slightly dirty as you Ooh, watch I love it. those kind of films. Oh, yeah. And at the end, the family found his brother's place. His brother won't let him in. So basically, they <laughs> they, they invade and kill his brother. <laughs> Whereas I was expecting him to get there and he'd be there in like a, a cable-knit sweater with a walking stick and he'd wave and let him in. No, it didn't, it didn't happen like that at all. No, no, really. Not even a piff helmet? No. Really fantastic movie. And there used to be, it was a very, very short-lived podcast called Closer to Midnight. And they did a really fantastic deep dive into the book and the film, including with an interview of someone who was in the film. And sadly, the podcast is no more. But on deathofgrass.com, which is a, a site dedicated to the book, you can actually access and listen to the Close to Midnight podcast on it. I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's well worth checking out. And it's a real shame the two guys who did that podcast didn't continue because it's very good. It's very mm-hmm. good. Well worth checking out if you're interested in Death of Grass uh, and No Blade of Grass, the Cornell Wild film. Yeah. I think at some point in the future, we're probably going to continue this uncozy catastrophe conversation looking at TV and films. But I think for now, We've had a good conversation. We've talked about James Herbert's progression. I think that'll do for James Herbert for at least a while on this podcast. Although we did have The Survivor as one of the options for the Halloween special. Or was it the the Ghost Story for Christmas special? I can no longer remember. And I did actually pick up two copies of The Survivor with the awesome skull with the 747 flying into the (laughs) eye socket. 
Um, so we'll maybe cover that at some point in the future. But for now, thanks very much, chaps. But before we go, Miles, you are a podcaster. I am indeed. Tell us about the Casual Trek podcast. Okay, so Casual Trek is a podcast I do with my friend Charlie Efridge Nunn. Um, our basic conceit is that he's an X-Men fan, I am a Doctor Who fan, so clearly the two of us are the most objectively critical of watching and ranking every single episode of the TV show Star Trek and putting it in a big numerical list. Some citation might be needed. Um, we just recently recorded an episode where we talk about um, Star Trek, the motion picture, which um, is a lot of is a lot of fun. You can find us on all your good podcatchers. It's my favorite Trek movie. Oh, it's honestly, it's honestly mine. Mm. I got a chance to see it on the big screen last year, and chef's kiss. Yeah, <laughs> I was so excited about the 4K version with the restored oh, director's cuts editions. Oh, it 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 was amazing oh. to watch on i i saw that and wrath of khan both in cinemas last year yeah. and wrath of khan holds up but motion picture it's one of those films which is why you have to see some of these films on the big screen like they were intended yeah you know the shots that you get of the um the face on shots of sulu looking gormless staring yeah. at the in, in, the interior of vija <laughs> as they go through it laboriously and slowly that's pretty much the look on my face for the entirety every time i watch that film i just sit there <laughs> slack yard with my chin sagging and i just stare I, at it i, I fucking love it I, I swear there's a moment where bones walks onto the bridge walks off and walks back on three minutes later <laughs> as if he's forgotten his bloody keys well with, with the exception of when he first arrives with his medallion looking like oh and the disco, the the, oh the hippie beard is amazing absolutely incredible i'll i'll love the fact he has the freak out about um the the transporter i love the bit where he says the drafted me i love the bits where the, the you know the the, the best bits of Star Trek are always the dialogue between the three principals. But yeah. for the rest of the film, all he has to do is walk on the bridge, look grumpy, and walk off the bridge. So if he does it a couple of times in three minutes, you've got to, you know, you've you, got to say you, good that's luck the Yancey movie. So, yeah. so, so given that Star Trek takes place in a post apocalypse, is Star Trek a, a cozy catastrophe? Star Trek is absolutely a cozy catastrophe. But in, <laughs> and that's why I dislike New Trek. Because they're trying to turn it into an uncozy catastrophe. Strange I'm New Worlds. Strange New Worlds is a lot. Of, Strange New Worlds is very trad trek, and it's yeah. a lot of fun. I like Strange New Worlds because I like I like the cast. The cast are great. Oh, the cast and is great. Back to an episodic approach, but there was a couple of episodes of Discovery the season where they had Anson Mount in that as Pike, where there were two or three episodes where. They were just like original classic Trek episodes, and they gave me a yep. really warm, fuzzy feeling. There was one where they found, a, I don't know, a church and a ranch or something on a planet. Yep. It's, it's part of the overall arc, but there's a scene where Pike is on that planet and is talking to the guy who now knows that there is life in outer space, and it is such a wonderful, sweet, classic Trek moment, that entire conversation. It was wonderful. So yeah, I enjoyed Strange New Worlds, but the rest of it can fuck off, especially Picard. That's absolute garbage. I, I have to catch up on Picard. I am, I uh, I am a season behind on Picard, and um... best place to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, ideally you want to be at negative one seasons with Picard because it's terrible. But anyway, yeah, so true. where can people find the Casual Trek podcast? Because this is turned into a Trek podcast all of a sudden. Where can <laughs> people find the actual uh, you Casual can Trek podcast? You can find it if you type in Casual Trek into all your good and bad pod podcasters. You can also find us on the part of the Nerd and Tie Network at www.nerdandtie.com forward slash Casual Trek. And, you know, enjoy it. You know, if you want to check out the show, go for it. Enjoy. And hopefully you don't find our accents too annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will link to it in the show notes. But before we go, we haven't. Co I, I commented on my horrible wild child beer, but you gentlemen haven't co commented on your beer. Uh, both my beers were really good. I admittedly may have uh, gone through them a lot quicker than I should have, hmm. because there there was a there was a point a little while ago when you were talking about the the nature of good and evil in the dark. When I was kind of feeling the effects of the beer. Hmm. 
it, it's been a while since I've indulged in such excessive, excessive drinking. Yeah, oh. that could also just but be no. a side effect of listening to me talking. <laughs> the um, I'll say the Black Mass uh, Black IPA is really good. Mm. That's Abbey Abbey Dale. That's up your way, isn't it? Sheffield. Sheffield, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very good, actually. All, all their beers are good. Um, so, if they are listening, I'm sure they would they would like to sponsor you. That would be wonderful, right? Mm, well, beer sponsorship. <laughs> just imagine. Um, so, just in summary, uh, Wild Child Dope Fiend, that can fuck off. Um, no to that. The first one I had was the Wasted Christmas Pudding Festive Porter. I've got to say, I don't know why I keep on buying these stupid porters because they're either horrible or barely passable. Yeah, so that one was barely passable. It didn't make me feel ill. Um, but this one I'm drinking now, actually, the Sticky Toffee Stout from Kirksel Brewery at 6% is actually delicious. Oh. So at least I got one to finish on a high with. So, you know what, gents? Absolute pleasure to have you in Derry Tom's. Yep. Derry Tom's? <laughs> Sweet Jeebus. Absolute pleasure to have you. Um, thanks for coming along. Brilliant. No Thank problem. You. Thank you for having us. Space. The casual frontier. Charlie is a writer and X Men fan. I'm Miles, writer and Doctor Who fan. On this show, we have set ourselves the challenge of watching every episode and movie of Star Trek and ranking them from best to worst on a big list. We like Star Trek, but it's not our first fandom. So if anyone can be guaranteed to undertake this grand voyage, it should be two guys who think that Star Trek's all right. Casual Trek, part of the Nerd and Tie podcast network. Available on all good podcast catchers. Live long and have a jelly baby. What's next? I don't know. Oh. Oh. Massive thanks to Graham and Miles for joining me in Derry and Tom's. In our discussion, I mentioned John Christopher's The Death of Grass and the Gonzo film adaptation Noble Head of Grass, directed by Cornell Wilde. For a great deep dive into both the book and the film, search for the Closer to Midnight podcast, which can be heard via the website deathofgrass.com although the podcast is sadly no more. I will link to it in the show notes, though. Over on YouTube, we continue to build a steady listenership, and we've had some great comments recently. Paul Miles said, Grapefruit with cherries. Oh, wink emoji. And can I recommend The Fungus by Harry Adam Knight? Right up your street if you like Guy and Smith-esque kind of novels. Wink emoji. I'll sign off now with, Good morning, Kevin. Cheers, Paul. I'll definitely track that one down. Meanwhile, David Meredith asked, Can someone remember a short story going by the name of The Mad God's Omelette? Not by Mocock. Think it was in an RPG mag. Keep up the good work. You've wrecked my sleep pattern. And thanks. Yes, indeed, David, and thank you too. But it was in White Dwarf issue 59, written by Dave Langford. And here's an extract. Erich smiled a bitter smile. What has this world done for me that I should do now? That which doing, the world should fain have me do for it, he demanded, unanswerably, indicating at the time his squint, his humped back, his warts, and the black, rune-carved artificial leg, slugbane, which supported his emaciated form. Also, he instead teased me with embargo exclamations. Cheers, Ian. I'll see you there at some point. John Lee commented on Wheels of Terror Part 1. Read all the Sven Hassel books at least twice during the 80s. The film I thought was shite. One day, John, Robbo and I will hook up for part two, and we'll definitely talk in more detail about the film. YouTube channel Honest Movie Reactions dropped us a line to say about the Crab's Moon show, you guys are great. This came onto my feed so randomly, but I'm so happy that it did. My husband and I live in Singapore. My husband's mum bought him Crab's Moon as a random gift when he's only 11 or 12. He used to love giant monster movies, etc. back in the day, and his mum thought this book was something like that. Little did she know that it was very violent and also full of sex. I have many British friends here in Singapore and it's always interesting to see where they're from because they all have different accents. Well, thanks for that lovely feedback and I recommend listeners check out Honest Movie Reactions, particularly the reaction to A Bridge Too Far, probably one of my favourite World War II flicks, behind Kelly's Heroes, 
Where Eagles Dare, Cross of Iron, The Keep. Okay, so one of my favourite conventional war films, perhaps. Finally, Art Vandalay commented on Fortress of the Pale Part 1 saying, Just discovered this. I've been reading the Elric series, but at times find it easier to listen to audiobooks or podcasts. Wonderful work on this. Thanks, Art. And he added, regarding Part 2, in response to Loz and I bemoaning the stouts and musing over alternatives for the future, wine would be a good choice. Well, I think he's spot on, Art. Although, just before I recorded this, Loz messaged me with a recipe for a wine and absinthe cocktail, so watch this space. Thanks for all that interaction, folks. Please do keep it coming. And thanks, as always, to our patrons. First, those without tear. Anthony Piconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster and Sebastian Weetabix. And our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Jim Kirkland, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Lee Gary, Malpertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Menion, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Scott Butler, Simon Perrins, Tony Malazzo, Ray Otis, Jim Knight, and finally, boarding the Donblass via a brief layover at the Three Pigeons for Pies and Pints, Gabriel Laycock. Gabriel said, Hello, I live in West Yorkshire and grew up on Michael Moorcock. When I was small, I could still find the Mayflower editions in charity shops for 20p each, and have kept reading his stuff ever since. Very much looking forward to part three of The Fortress of the Pearl, and I like the idea of a wandering beer table. I shall surely be stealing that idea. Thanks, Gabriel. As we may be moving on to a wandering wine table, I sincerely hope you can keep that flame alive. And you living in that neck of the woods has reminded me that there is a Moorcock Inn not too far from you. One of three, in fact, within about an hour's drive from us, so I suspect we may need to add Moorcock Inn pub reviews to our itinerary. Something for further down the line, perhaps. And of course, thanks to our crafty Juggadero's, Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Tom Murphy, Mark Hebden, Graham Holden, and Jason Connolly. And eternal thanks to our patron demons, Andy Darby, Clarky the Cruel, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Gwen Barlow, Imria, Janie Stim, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Liam Jay, Miles Reed Lobato, Mortmain, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, David Lee, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last, but never least, Robert McMillan. Okay, enough yakking. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins@outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too. There are a few extra rods and sods on there. Stay tuned after the Song of the Swords for a taste of Decadnids with Gin Dangly Canis. Thanks for the pronunciation challenge, Graham. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods.